Welcome to our Sound for Video session. It is the 12th of September, 2016. I had to record a little bit early this week. Um, if I miss your question, I apologize for that. Go ahead and uh, I'll answer it next week. But if you need an answer sooner because you have some sort of gig coming up, a job, and you really need some advice ASAP, go ahead and email me back um, and let me know. And I can do my best to answer your question right away so we can get you up and running and ready for your shoot. Let's go ahead and review uh, just one item from last week, and then we have a series of questions here I wanted to address. First, from last week, uh, from Russell Peed. Russell had a question last week about uh, recording a church service, and in doing so, he had a mixer board that was getting all of the data or all of the sound from various microphones, doing the mix, and then feeding that out to his Tascam DR60D Mark II, and also to his. Um, his camera rig, which included a Nikon uh, DSLR plus a uh, Atomos Ninja Blade recorder, so an HDMI recorder. And what he was finding was that there was a sync issue between the two. So after about an hour long shoot, um, a continuous shoot, there was a difference of about three to four frames between the Tascam recorder and the Ninja Blade. So. Anyway, so that was a, kind of a challenge, and once you start to bring that into post and you have to sync all that up, things get really messy, and it's, it's unpleasant. One of the things we suggested for Russell was, hey, instead of sending the audio into the Atomos recorder, send it into your camera, and let's see if that makes a difference at all, because then we can kind of identify where the source of the drift is occurring, and usually the Tascam's pretty solid. It's not perfect, but it's pretty solid. Um, also had pretty good luck with my Nikon as well, and it keeps it in sync with the p picture because it's recording the audio with the picture. So he did that and wrote the following. I wanted to update you after your suggestion. I tested out plugging the output of the Tascam DR60D Mark II directly into the Nikon D750 camera instead of the Atomos Ninja Blade, and it made a huge difference. The drift went from three or four frames after an hour or so to only half a frame after an hour and a half. And then he attached some screenshots. This will help greatly for sure. Thank you for the recommendation and look forward to continue to improve on my sound. Russell, I think we found the problem. Good work. <laughs> so definitely it's the blade. And actually, I have found this a similar type thing. I have a, I have a couple of Atomos recorders as well. I have a Shogun and I also have the Ninja 2. And while they're great HDMI recorders in terms of the picture that they capture, um, the audio... Uh, not necessarily quite as great, and I, that's why I don't generally record the audio. Even though the Shogun has XLR inputs, which actually sound pretty decent, um, I don't generally use them because I get some funky drifting type, types of issues. So in any case, glad that helped, and thanks for the question again. Next question, Jeff Brass. Hi, Curtis. I've just shot a series of interviews. All went well. Recorded main audio onto a DR60 dual mono to give me a safety track of minus 6 dB to the main. One of the people we interviewed would start each sentence very loud, clipping on the main channel, then lower their voice. The safety track is great for the loud parts, but too quiet for the softer spoken parts. Is there a good way of blending these two? At the moment, I'm going through in audition manually cutting and fading between them. Thanks. Jeff, let me just kind of share with you a few thoughts here that hopefully will help. Here's a similar type situation. You could go about this two different ways. And I don't know what your noise floor is looking like on that recording, but you could take the safety track and just use that where there's no clipping and then just come in and do some compression on the, the loudest peaks. That's one way you could do it. Again, that may not be an option if you've got a lot of noise floor or, you know, if the noise floor is sitting relatively high in the overall recording. Um, so, you know, your mileage may vary on that. Another way you could do it is you could use the track that actually clipped and use the repair clip uh, feature here and that is actually under here it is under diagnostics declipper you can use that to actually if their clipping is not too bad if it's not too extreme which it sounds like it's not it's just at the start of each sentence you could potentially use this to fix those clips and then come in and do the same thing there is another tool that can be really helpful and this could work on the safety track or after you've fixed the clipping on the main track if you come under effects, amplitude and compression, use the speech volume leveler. This has three main settings. If you go to the default, the three main settings are target volume level, leveling amount, and target dynamic range. So 
what I would probably do as a start, and you're going to have to tweak these settings to get it just right. For the target volume level, I would come over here to Amplitude Statistics. If that's not showing, go to Window, Amplitude Statistics. Go ahead and scan that for the entire file. It will give you this total RMS amplitude. Right now we're sitting at minus 24. So I would actually want to use something close to that for my target volume level because I don't want to really affect the dot, you know, the overall loudness here. So I'm going to crank this down. The lowest setting I can actually use is minus 20. So I'm just going to go ahead and go with that because that's the closest that we have to minus 24. So we're at minus 20. Leveling amount. Leveling amount. I would actually pull this down significantly, maybe to about 10%, and use that as your on your first pass. Doing extreme things doesn't generally work well because what will happen is the breaths, this is a breath right here between phrases, it'll pull that way up too, and you don't want that. Then for target dynamic range, I leave it around 45 dB. That tends to work pretty well for dialogue in many cases, but you may have to tweak that as well. Let's go ahead and click apply and watch what happens. You can see it brought the loud parts way down. Um, and overall, this looks like a pretty good track that we could now work with. And I would probably still run a compression, some compression on here to get these transient peaks and bring those back in. And then from there, I would loudness normalize it. So I just drag this file down into the match loudness panel, which if you don't have, again, window, match loudness, it'll show up down here. Drop this file down in there. I would set this to whatever loudness target you're aiming for. If you're going online, eventually you're going to probably want to put this at minus 19 LUFS if you have a mono dialog track, or at minus 16 LUFS if you have a stereo track. Leave the other settings at the default, click run, and that will loudness normalize it for you. So um, I hope, Jeff, that gives you some, some options. I would say this about safety tracks. They're really only useful a, if you like to punish yourself with tedious work, which I know you don't, <laughs> um, and and be able to you know cut in every, the start of every single phrase, that's going to be a nightmare to do. Obviously, if you just have a really short piece, maybe it's okay, but probably probably not a sustainable way to do things. And as you know, and that's probably why you asked the question. Um, but the other way um, you can do it is what we've shown here that would hopefully help quite a bit. I, I actually find those safety tracks mostly just to be helpful in cases where you have a clip that you've recorded where 99% of it's good and there's just one area where things got out of control, where someone got really, really loud or laughed or something really loudly. In those cases, then I would just cut in just that one part and uh, crossfade and then kind of, you know, level things out a little bit and get it to where you want it. But if you're having to do it at the start of every phrase, probably not feasible. And so hopefully that gives you some things you can work with. That's a great question. Thanks for that, Jeff. Next one was from Tim. Tim says, I have a talkback event coming up and won't have a PA. By For those of you who are not aware, PA, public address system, that is a microphone, an amplifier, and speakers in the room for a live sound setup. Um, it's a small room and I can only have one mic. What mic should I use to record, record both the speakers and the audience? So it sounds like it's a setup where you'll either have a panel of people or maybe one person at a time speaking to an audience, and then perhaps you'll have questions from the audience, some some sort of format like that. What I would probably do is, first of all, look for some sort of lavalier, or not necessarily a lavalier, but an omnidirectional microphone. 99% of lavalier microphones are omnidirectional, so if you don't have other choices, that could work in a pinch. Um, and then um, in terms of placement of that microphone, I would place it a little bit closer to the people who will do, be doing the speaking, but not right up next to them. Um, and then that way it will capture the speakers who will be doing most of the talking, presumably. And then it will capture the audience who will be asking the periodic questions or comments. So that would be my approach. Now, if you are going to use um, an omnidirectional mic, which again, I recommend stay away from cardioids, stay away from super cardioids or hypercardioids, anything that's very directional because you're gonna have a nightmare of a time capturing everyone if you try to use one of those. Um, I would place that omnidirectional lavalier or op omnidirectional mic, whether it's a lavalier or a small diaphragm condenser or any other kind of mic on a stand and try and kind of put it up high enough so that Nobody's blocking it. You want it up just high enough so it's above, maybe just barely above the heads of the audience. Um, or if there's going to be a big difference in terms of the height of the speakers in the audience, I'd put it up closer to the height of this, the speakers, people speaking. Um, and that would hopefully do well for you. So again, a lavalier is an option in most cases if it's an omnidirectional. I'd put it on a stand. I would not wear it on your body 
and sit on the front row because then you're going to block all the sound from behind you. So it needs to go on a stand where it's unimpeded in terms of the sound waves in the room. Um, and then if you don't have a lavalier microphone or you have something like maybe a Zoom H1 recorder or a Zoom H2 um, or even a Zoom H4 or H5 or H6, all those that have the built-in microphones, uh, what I would do is place that again, same place, but uh, aim one of the microphones. They, they're kind of off at, you know, 90 degree angle. Face one towards the speakers, the other one towards the audience. And uh, that should do pretty well pick up. The H2 is, is unique from the standpoint that it has, I think, five different speakers, if I'm not mistaken. So it does kind of a surround type of recording. Um, that could work pretty well where you'd have some of the mics aimed at the speakers and then the rest aimed at the audience. So those are some thoughts that I have in terms of that kind of unique situation. I hope those help in, in that situation. That could be a tough one to do, but that's probably your best bet in terms of capturing the speakers and the audience all. All right, next question is from Mamoun Syed. I am a big fan of your work and enjoy watching your videos. Thanks, I appreciate that. My question is, do you have any tips for people who have to record audio in concrete rooms with minimal sound dampening and a fair amount of ambient noise? My school has an ancient centralized air conditioning system. Yes, I have some ideas for you. First thought, you're probably going to want to use a cardioid pickup pattern microphone. Not super cardioid, not hypercardioid, cardioid. Um, and what I would do is boom that from above the person speaking, aim down at them at a 45 degree angle. You don't have to use an expensive boom pole. You can just use a boom microphone stand. Um, on stage stands in the United States make some great stands. They're $25 US. Um, they are available in most countries as I understand it. Um, it's a pretty simple stand. They're sturdy. They do a good job. So I would get one of those. Um, aim it down at the talent at 45 degrees, 45 degree angle, generally at their mouth or their chin area, um, and just boom it so it's just barely out of frame. It needs to stay close, as close as you can get it to them, and still be out of the frame. Um, and then from there, I realize you can't do a lot of sound dampening, but if you can do one thing to dampen sound, this would help tremendously, and that is put a rug or some other soft material, a blanket, thicker the better, underneath the person and slightly behind the person covering that con part of the concrete floor. That will help reduce some of the reflections that end up going into the microphone. And because you're in a concrete room, there's sound bouncing everywhere. So those are probably my, my uh, biggest tips that you can do, relatively low cost, and hopefully something that you can kind of add to your particular shoot there that will help quite a bit. The idea is that you want cardioid instead of supercardioid or hypercardioid because a cardioid microphone essentially picks up nothing from behind it. And that's gonna do the best at rejecting all of that ambient sound and all the reflections that are bouncing around everywhere in the room behind the mic. Um, the problem with a supercardioid or a hypercardioid is that they do pick up some of the sound from behind. Not as much as on the front, but still definitely some from behind. So you wanna avoid those. <clears throat> all right, I hope that helps Mamoon. I, know, I realize you can't necessarily do all of those, but um, hopefully some of those ideas will help. All right, next is a question from Julian. Julian, is there a cheaper alternative to the Tascam Zoom recorders to connect a shotgun mic with an XLR input? I don't have a mic input on my camera. Ooh, that's a tough one, Julian. There probably is one. Um, the Tascam, Tascam has an older recorder called the DR40. It's not that great by today's standards. It was decent at the time, but the preamps are pretty noisy on it. Um, but it's probably the least expensive, you know, halfway decent recorder with XLR mic inputs that I'm aware of. Um, they may have some others, but I would actually probably recommend going with a Tascam DR60D Mark II, but buy a used one. Um, you should be able to find a used one of those for relatively little money. So I don't, I don't know what your budget is, but if that were my only option, that's what I would aim to do first. Um, because you don't have a mic input on your camera, there are some lower cost adapter, audio adapters that could work. Um, one that I tested fairly recently was the Ceramonic. Um, I don't remember the model number, but I'll put a link to the review that we did. We actually compared three, one from Ceramonic, one from Beach Tech, and one from Juiced Link. The Ceramonic was the least expensive one, and its XLR input was surprisingly good. However, the problem is it then needed to feed the audio to your camera, so that won't work in your case. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, 
Tascam DR40, if you insist on having a new one, um, you might be able to find that for less than the DR60D Mark II. If not, I would look at saving up until you could afford a used one. And you should be able to find used ones on, I don't know what they have in your country, um, if you have eBay or, you know, um, whatever, whatever other used places there are, you could potentially look at those. All right, last question, Mark Latani. I have, I happened to cross, this is actually a question that's not directly related to sound, but indirectly. So thanks for that, Mark. It's a good one for, it's a really practical question. I happened to cross an older YouTube video you did on the Camerar TK3 camera cage. What cage do you use now? I want to combine my Canon 6D, my new aperture monitor, and my Tascam recorder. Let me show you what I use. I currently use this. This is the Verivon Zeus Uni. Um, this was this is the nice thing about this one is it can fit almost any DSLR or mirrorless camera. You can see it collapses this small to fit most of the like the really small uh, Sony cameras that many of us are shooting, but it also expands to fit very large <laughs> DSLRs. Um, so it's not ratcheted down right now. That's why it looks kind of floppy. It doesn't look that way once you get it all tightened up and set it on your camera. It also has this top handle, which is removable, which is very nice. This also swings. You've got lots of quarter 20 taps for attaching various things all around the, the whole rig here on the sides, uh, kind of a cheese plate on this side. And then of course, there's some on the bottom, although you probably won't use those as much. Um, so that's the one I use. Um, I'm not saying you have to use this or I'm suggesting that you necessarily use this one. I really like this one because I know that when I upgrade to a new camera, it's probably gonna fit the new camera as well. The nice thing about this as well is that it leaves the right-hand side of your camera open so you can still reach all of the main controls that you use on this side. You can still get to the memory cards and you can still get to the batteries. In almost all cameras, those are all mounted on the right, or those are all positioned on the right-hand side of your camera. So the Zeus, Uni from Verivon is a, is a rather nice option. Um, aside from that, there are some other Uni options like this, but they tend to be much more expensive. I, I would love to have a um, Zacuto makes one like this, but it's, it's nicer. <laughs> um, but it's a whole lot more expensive, ridiculously expensive actually. So probably not an option for many of us. You can also look at other cages that are made specifically for your camera model. Um, those are tricky though, because once you upgrade, your, your new camera may or may not fit that cage. And the cages that are made for dedicated camera models are, the reason they're made for those is they have the cutouts in the right places for the controls, for the battery, for the LCD screen, if it flips out. Um, so they're kind of limiting and they're still, you know, even the decent ones are still pretty expensive in the 200 or some dollar range. So. That's the problem with those. Um, they can work great while you have that camera, but when it comes time to upgrade, it's a little bit of a sad day. <laughs> so that's my particular thought. The, 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 you know, the downside, I don't know how you want to mount things exactly. You could put the Tascam underneath. Um, I prefer not to do that. Um, I don't know which Tascam you're recording with. I think it's the DR60D Mark II, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but that one gets a little flimsy. It's The body is made out of plastic. And so once you put a whole camera rig up on top of it, things can start to get kind of shaky and they don't necessarily inspire confidence. So, um, but then re attaching that recorder to this, you know, you're kind of limited in terms of your options. You could, um, when I do, and I don't usually do this, I, um, I don't usually connect my audio recorder to my rig, but I understand why you, in many cases you would want to do that. Um, but what I did is I actually attached it to the side plate here and oriented it in, in a vertical position. And I realized that seems kind of weird because the whole recorder is meant to be in a horizontal orientation. Um, but I know the recorder well enough that having it on its side didn't bother me. I was able to control everything I needed to control and still access all the buttons and menus and so on and so forth. And it also, that way I could route the... Um, I could route the cables vertically, you know, either up or down, depending on where I wanted to put them. So anyway, those are some thoughts on camera cages. Again, if you submitted a question after I recorded this session, don't worry, we'll answer those next week. Or if you need an answer right away because you have a gig or a job coming up, totally understand that. Just go ahead and email me back. I'll be happy to do my best to get you, you know, whatever information you're looking for to get that job done. So don't want to hold anyone up there. Um, just wanted to spend a couple minutes talking about a recent job. Just today, in fact, I shot another piece 
if you follow my YouTube channel, you've probably seen this space here before. I, I guess I should just go ahead and tell you, this is my actual day employer. I actually have a day job. And on my day job, I am fortunate enough to, to on a part-time basis, be a video production guy. And um, <laughs> so I get to do a fair number of jobs here, and it's, it's a lot of fun. In this particular case, I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of a practical element. We talked about sound bags a few weeks ago. I just wanted to kind of give you a quick update here on that. Um, sound bags are hard to wear for long periods of time when you're booming a microphone because they are they get heavy. Even if it's even if your recorder is not that heavy, um, they tend to get heavy very quickly. And I talk we talked last week about or a few weeks ago about sound bags and how I made a big mistake of buying a really big one first because I wanted to be able to put all my stuff in it. Well, the reality is, is once you start booming and you're just using the shoulder strap that comes with the bag, um, it gets heavy really fast. And so the reality is, is that when you're booming, you want to have as little stuff in this bag as possible. You want to have your mixer, recorder, you want to have any wireless receivers you need, and as little else as possible. And all the rest of your stuff, which you do need, like, you know, your little kit that has all the stuff that you'd use to hide lavalier microphones and such... Um, all that can go in a separate bag that you can drop some in some corner while you're actually doing your work. So um, in addition to that, I still found that wearing the strap that comes with the bags can get very uncomfortable. And in the case of the Orca bags, which is what we're looking at here, this is an Orca OR30. This one fits my sound devices 633. It also fits a Zoom F8 very nicely. And it will also fit the upcoming Zoom F4 very nicely, which I'm very excited about. Um, we're going to try and get our hands on the Zoom F4 recorder as soon as possible and do a review on that for you. Um, but in any case, um, this is a smaller bag, and that helps a lot. Uh, that whole issue of carrying around a lot of weight while you're booming a microphone and actually recording. Um, but that strap that came with it, it's a fantastic strap. It's very thickly padded. It's a very wide strap. Um, but the reality is, is with a strap, it's putting all the pressure and all the weight on one part of your body, pretty much one shoulder. And after a while, that gets just really hard to carry around. So um, I was fortunate to have this time this Orca OR40 harness, which you can see includes this belt and also two shoulder straps. And you attach the belt here to the bag at the lower part on the back of the bag on both sides, and then also the harness uh, on the loops at the top of the bag on either side. And this distributes the weight so much more effectively, and it is so much, so much more comfortable. In addition to that, um, these particular straps, while they're thick and padded, um, they also have a nylon mesh that encases the whole thing. So they breathe pretty nicely, much better than, you know, on typical backpacks, it's just a strap um, with some sort of kind of... Uh, some sort of nylon material that's a very tight weave. This actually is a very broad mesh weave. Very sturdy still, um, but definitely leaves lots of breathing room. So when you're out there sweating, <laughs> which you do when you're booming a mic like this, um, it's it's a better design so it keeps you a little bit cooler, which is nice. And it also doesn't have a full vest on the back. It's just a strap that attaches these uh, shoulder straps in the back to the belt below. Um, so it works really, really nicely. I'm really pleased with it. Again, that's the Orca OR40 audio harness. In addition to that, it has a cool feature I haven't used yet, but there's this pocket on the back. You can just barely see it, this black strip over here. That is actually a battery pocket, and you can hook up a battery in there to this USB cable that has an outlet on the front. So if you need to provide uh, USB power to something, you can do that pretty nicely too. Not a feature I've used yet, but pretty clever design and always good to know that it's there if I need it. So really super happy with that. Now, obviously it's expensive, it's not for everybody, but if you're doing a lot of bag jobs and booming microphone jobs, um, this could be uh, a back saver. <laughs> but let me tell you a couple of other things about this particular shoot. We were actually doing a shoot where uh, this particular scene here, you can see the camera sitting up on a sort of a homemade gimbal or steady cam type of thing here you can't see the whole thing but um, I had another I had one of my colleagues who was camera operating um, and uh, I was actually booming over his shoulder and we were walking backwards towards this direction here as the talent walked toward us and was talking so it was kind of a walking talking headshot um, and it worked out pretty well having the just the strap 
for the bag would have made it a lot harder because when you have just a single strap, the bag has a tendency to sort of move around. Um, and this harness keeps it right in place. So it was so much easier for me to, to do the job, keep the boom mic out of the frame and avoid the cameraman backing into me. <laughs> so it was a, it was a real dream. Other lessons learned on this particular one. Um, I have talked about this office space before. And one thing I've noticed they've started putting in offices more recently, especially these open office designs where they have cubicles with relatively low walls is that they often now are putting in white noise generators. So these are little speakers in the ceiling that actually generate white noise. And it's awful for recording video. Um, however, what I was able to do is I was able to track down the facilities manager and ask if we could turn those off, and she gladly obliged, which was really, really helpful. Then we were only contending with the air conditioning. <laughs> so that reduced a lot of the noise. Again, a practical thing that you can do when you're shooting like this. Um, don't assume that someone's going to tell you no. At least ask. If they say no, you know, it's okay and you just have to deal with it. But if you don't ask, you'll never know whether or not it's possible to turn some, of, you know, something off that's creating noise. So I didn't, I wasn't so bold as to ask if they could turn off the AC because <laughs> there were still people working in the office. So I didn't want to do that. And it was still a pretty warm day here. Um, but then the other thing I also learned was in some of these shots and this one in particular... I had to boom that mic up high, and when I walked past, you know, we shot past air conditioning registers or outlets where the air was actually blowing out, the microphone, of course, picked a lot of that up. I was using a hypercardioid microphone, that's my Audio-Technica 4053B, and what ended up happening in this case is the lavalier microphone, which I was also recording, you can see right here, well, barely see, on this outer pocket I have my Rode Link receiver here. Um, so we actually put a lav mic on this talent as well. And it turns out the lav mic is the one I'm probably going to use in this case because um, while I don't love the sound of lavalier microphones, this actually got the better recording on this lavalier mic because it, it wasn't as uneven in terms of picking up the H or the air conditioning as we walked past each of the registers. So there's a lesson learned there as well. Always, if you can, record with two mics, a lavalier and a boom. And then you have options in post to get the best, the one that sounds the best. So that was another lesson learned. And then finally, um, in terms of mounting that lavalier microphone, um, fortunately the talent was wearing a button down shirt. That is one of my favorites for men <laughs> and women if they're wearing a button down shirt as well, um, in terms of hiding a lavalier microphone because it has a button placket. This is a button placket here, kind of this the center part that with thicker fabric where the buttons uh, attach. And what I do, is I, I use my Senkin COS 11D lavalier microphone. That comes with a little rubber insert that you can stick the mic into. And then I put tape on both sides of that rubber insert and then just hide it underneath the button placket here and sandwich it with, again, with the tape on both sides between the two layers of the shirt, the back and the front. And that worked beautifully in this case. And I had the, just the head of the mic pointing out just a little bit to, you know, kind of aimed out of the button placket just out on the side here. And that worked really, really well. Taping on both sides helped because then as he moved, um, we didn't get the clothing rubbing against the microphone or rubbing against itself in that particular spot. And so we were able to get a much cleaner recording in that case. So for those of you that are looking for tips on how to hide lavalier microphones, that one works pretty well. Um, and that way the microphone moves with the clothing instead of the clothing moving across the microphone or the microphone moving across the clothing and that creates all sorts of noise and it sounds horrible. So those are some lessons learned. I hope those were helpful for you. Again, if you submitted a question after this was recorded, don't worry, we'll get to your question next week. Or if you need an answer right away, again, let me know and we'll get that to you um, before your job or you know your, your upcoming shoot. Um, get out there and keep making some good sound and we will talk to you again next week. Take care, everyone.